in the past few weeks, we've learned that the coronavirus is killing and hospitalizing Black Americans at greater rates than any other group. Dr. Vickers and some leading uh, health professionals, African American health professionals, uh, penned a very thoughtful op-ed in USA Today on Friday. And I wanted to have an opportunity to ask him questions about that. But I thought I would frame the discussion by just talking about the facts. In Alabama, African Americans account for 52% uh, of the deaths and 37% of the confirmed cases, but just 26% of the population. In Louisiana, African Americans account uh, for 70% of the deaths and more than uh, 32, uh, twice that, or uh, 32, more than uh, twice the 32% of the share of the population. In New York, African Americans make up 9% of the population and 17% of the deaths. And in Michigan, Black African Americans make up 14% uh, of the population, uh, but 32% of its coronavirus cases and 40% of the overall deaths uh, from COVID-19. You know, the reality is that these health disparities are staggering. And the numbers are not surprising in some, some ways since African Americans consistent, consistently have faced, worth health, have faced worse health outcomes than, Afri than white Americans. Um, a much higher percentage of African Americans in the South especially are considered high risk due to pre-existing conditions like diabetes and high blood pressure, uh, where uh, uh, which are associated with lack of economic and health resources. I think so much of this uh, has stemmed from a systemic disinvestment in our communities. But I think it's really important as Alabama is about to approach what we are, uh, what the healthcare, public health professionals are calling our surge um, the week of April 20th, I thought it was particularly important that we have a conversation about the health disparities in our community. You know, Alabama 7th Congressional District, uh, our district, has the largest population of African Americans in Alabama. Um, we represent both inner city Birmingham as well as the rural Black Belt. I'm particularly concerned with the lack of testing that we've seen in the Black Belt, that this condition will only be exacerbated. I wanna bring in Dr. Vickers at this point. Dr. Vickers uh, has served as Senior Vice President for uh, Medicine and the Dean of the School of Medicine at UAB since 2013. He is a native of Alabama, having uh, grown up in the Huntsville, North Alabama area. He is a member of the Institute of Medicine and a renowned surgeon, pancreatic uh, cancer researcher and pioneer in health disparity research. Uh, as I said, he's also a native of Alabama. Welcome, Dr. Vickers, uh, to this conversation. Really want to applaud you for uh, your leadership in not only leading the state in facing the COVID-19 crisis that we're experiencing in the state of Alabama, but also uh, shining a bright light at the health disparities, um, uh, especially among African Americans uh, caused by this disease. That this disease has actually really spotlight, put a spotlight on health disparities that we've seen all along and you've been a leading researcher on. Welcome to this conversation, sir. And wanted to give you an opportunity to give your initial thoughts before we open it up for questions. Thank you, Representative Sewell. I appreciate both your commitment to this district and to your constituents to have this uh, video session and this Facebook Live opportunity to address this issue. I think your summary of things um, really uh, highlighted what we feared. Um, there, there was a, a, one of the principles that we tried to, tried to share in the op-ed is that um, whenever there are flaws or significant uh, defects in a system, crises tend to exacerbate them. And if you look at our healthcare system, the persistent flaws that we've had is our inability to address the disparities that have existed in minority populations that we've known for some period of time. I think our country is toyed with how serious this is and what it means, is it self-inflicted? Um, all of those things are not true necessarily, but there are things that people have often uh, thought about in the context of how to approach it. I think COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 has clearly uh, uncovered and highlighted the risk and the danger of a pandemic or any significant illness on top of a population that exists. And many of these people are doing the right things. They're managing their diabetes. 
they're managing their heart disease and they're managing their kidney failure. They're managing their COPD. But that in this scenario does not spare you. We're not talking about the people who are just ignoring their health. We're talking to people who are living with their health that who've gotten infected. And once they get into the ICU, there's often an 80 to 90% chance they don't get out if they have these illnesses. If you look at the studies from other countries, our data may improve upon that, but the data at other countries is very worrisome. The other factor you see is that in most of our majority citizens who are dying, they're often in the 70s and 80s. The numbers for most of the African Americans are significantly younger. They're often in the 50s and 60s. And so we have people who are younger with disease who have limited ability to actually uh, survive some significant infection from this virus. The, the challenging part of this virus is that they're about uh, anywhere from, there are six sort of human coronaviruses that exist. This is one that's crossed over, obviously, from an animal source to a human. And so we don't have any experience to know what and how it infected us. Every time during the flu season, one of the viruses that will cause flu is a coronavirus. So we've had exposure to coronaviruses creating the normal upper respiratory tract flu. What's different about this virus is that it initially attacks the lower airway cells. So from the beginning, you get a couple of things that are distinct. You get typically a high fever, you get a dry cough, and you often, because it's in the lower part of your airway, you're often short of breath. And so early on, you get a risk. If you were to take a chest X-ray or a CT scan, early on, almost a, a large number, 70 to 80% of the people will have findings of a pneumonia, even though they may not be in the hospital. So this virus is different, and we're still evolving to understand how it affects us. And sadly, it's one of the things that's come along where we really don't have any proven treatment. The problem is, is that there are a lot of things floating around that people would like to have. There is a drug which fortunately was developed at UAB called Remdesivir that was just released, at least the, the compassionate use study was just released in the New England Journal of Medicine on Monday. Uh, the drug was developed here and then commercialized with Gilead. And it does appear to be, first of all, safe. And secondly, it seems to promote people healing. It's a single arm study. So it doesn't design, it's not designed, it's, it's not, the report out now is not yet definitive that it actually is making people better, but it clearly is not harming them. And it's pointing in a direction and improvement. Hydrochloroquine is still wait and see. Low dose clearly may have some impact, but it's not clear. Clearly high dose hydrochloroquine kills people. And they've stopped the study already using high dose hydrochloroquine because it affects the rhythm of your heart and two people have already died from high dose hydrochloroquine. So unfortunately, it's not a panacea. And what we do know in healthcare is that many of the things that cure diseases in either a test tube, a Petri dish, or an animal don't necessarily pan out to do the same in humans. If it would, we would have cured everything by now. So let's talk about health disparities. When people say uh, that health disparities exist, what do they mean by health disparities? Can you give us a definition of, of what a health disparity means? Look, at the end of the day, I get that um, so often I, you know, people say African Americans are predisposed to diabetes and hypertension. I, I do know that in my own background, my grandmother, great grandmother, all had hypertension and diabetes. Um, that um, it, it sometimes runs in family lines, but it also, uh, we've seen disproportionate populations uh, like people of color being predisposed to certain diseases. Um, is that exactly what, what is a health disparity, I guess? Can you just give us a, a definition? Yeah, so a health disparity is if you were to take, a per take an illness and look across the spectrum of our population and uh, stratify so that all things are equal in the context of how people live, their economics, uh, where they live, and you persistently see an increased incidence in that disease in that population that is not explained by necessarily both the genes they may have or necessarily any unique thing that's different about that population. 
and yet it persists. So as it relates to this country, these disparities exist in a number. And as over time, there may be some genetic component, but we don't know that for sure. Um, but for African Americans, that baseline difference that if I grow up in this country as an African American versus a white American, I have a significant chance of having a greater risk of having heart disease, having diabetes, and having kidney failure. Those disparities, those are the disparities that we often speak about that actually distinctly identify, are identified in a population. Another example are the Pima Indians. They have a, about a 60% rate of diabetes. And most likely that is genetically driven, but it is a high propensity of diabetes. The other factor that we've learned though that perpetuates our health disparities numbers and often keeps them from being resolved are these issues called the social determinants of health. We as physicians focus on the medical cause of disease. That's what most of our time's on. But what we've evolved to understand that a large number of illnesses and exacerbate or at least worsening of an illness has little to do with the illness at all, but it has very much to do with the person's social situation. Do they have power? Can they get a ride to the doctor? Are they, do they, they live in food deserts? Do they live in food deserts? Can they get their insulin stored in a right way? Kaiser, South, Southern California Kaiser did a study they call, they call it their vital 10%. This was 10% of their, of their population they served that use nearly 50% of their resources, just 10% of the people who use 50% of their resources. They decided just to call upon them to check and see what was going on. And what they found is that in almost 90% of the cases, when they were coming to the ER, it had nothing to do with a medical problem. It was either to do that I didn't get my check, my friend didn't bring this medicine, I lost my power, I couldn't get this meal, those were the factors that actually allowed their disease to worsen and sent them to the ER. And, and what they also found is that 90% of the ability to address them was often already in the community and they weren't connected. So, so, you know, so let's talk about it in terms of what we're experiencing now. Um, you know, for me, the challenge, I, I know that we live in Jefferson County and that we're currently in a hot spot. But, but Dr. Vickers, the reality is that not enough testing is being done in the black belt. And if we know, uh, given the current data that's coming in, and we're seeing nationally that African Americans are disproportionately affected by this disease and dying from this disease, whatever the reason, shouldn't we be trying to deploy more testing in those areas? And I know that I have been on the call, and I know you have too with Dr. Harris, and that he's doing his very best to deploy as many uh, testing sites as quickly as he can. But this thought of reopening the economy has to be in the context of being able to make sure that we get testing sites in our districts, in our communities, in African-American communities, that we show a serious prioritizing of placement of um, these facilities in our communities in order to make sure that we are getting tested before we can really think about reopening our, our economy. Your thoughts about that, sir? So I think one of the, the two principles that you bring up that are important, number one, um, unfortunately, our healthcare world is largely driven by economics. If you have significant income, you tend to have access to healthcare in the normal status of affairs. When things reach a crisis and people who didn't have, who had limited access with limited income, that's worsened, right? So in this scenario, <clears throat> as a country, we were way short, and you, you know all the litany of missteps that occurred in testing, and we were way underprepared for testing. Well, in those scenarios, the people who are at the lead, who are at the greatest risk in the normal scenario when your healthcare system is not under a pandemic are completely further worsened in a pandemic. So often no testing in those areas. And, and the other principle though that's most important that you raise, in this disease, if we don't take care of our most vulnerable populations, everybody suffers. Absolutely. The disease doesn't go away. The rich communities will still get infected. 
and everybody will be hurt by it. So we're all interconnected. It's all, it's all interconnected. This disease makes it totally clear that you just can't take care of the well-to-do community and forget about the community that doesn't have means because if you don't address it, the, the better off communities will suffer the same because we as a whole are interconnected, as you said. Absolutely. Well, I got a question from Roy Johnson of AL.com, the journalist. He says, um, testing in the black belt is extremely lacking. Um, and what are we doing to get more testing in uh, the region of the black belt? Likewise, his second part of his question was, in light of the effects of COVID-19 in a state like Alabama that hasn't expanded Medicaid, um, does uh, COVID-19 put a spotlight on the need for our state um, to expand Medicaid? How do we eliminate the partisanship, <laughs> that's probably my part, um, uh, partisanship that characterizes almost all our state <laughs> policies and get this done without making it a partisan issue? I'm gonna well, let you, I, I'll take the part. I'll take the partisan question. You answer the question about getting more. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say you you will do that, and it's about leadership, which I know you will provide. Um, I, I think that there is the testing mechanisms in in those counties are largely driven by two factors. They're driven by the Department of Health uh, offices in those counties, which unfortunately, and many have been closed, and they're driven by the regional hospitals. So the testing there is, is, is linked to those two things as the mechanism to get it. The problem is number one, getting the resources to those areas because there are limited testing swabs. We were short, the, the, one of the major companies that made the testing swabs was in Italy. And, and, and everybody knows a week ago or three weeks ago, what a tragic place Italy was. And so one, it's been supplies and infrastructure. So there is work to connect with those hospitals and many of those hospitals in, in areas and rural areas who send their tests to us through UAB, we test them for them. So we have relationships with Brian Whitfield. We have relationships with John Paul Jones. We have relationships with the Greenville Hospital and those places are able to send them to UAB for testing. And then the rest is driven by the Department of Public Health which I, I know for some degree, some offices have not been open. So I know that's been a problem. Great, now on the partisanship uh, part of it, I do believe, and I just want to make sure that, my, that um, the folks that I represent know, I have been a voice, continue to be a voice in trying to incentivize Alabama to uh, expand Medicaid. Uh, the reality is that uh, there are just too many uninsured in Alabama and uh, what expansion of Medicaid would get at are those working poor, the people who are not old enough to be on Medicare, not poor enough to be uh, on Medicaid. Um, they're the working poor. They're the ones who are stuck in the middle. And what expanding Medicaid would do is give greater access to quality health care to more Alabamians. Um, on the question of whether or not you think, Dr. Uh, Victors, whether or not you think this is an opportunity for us to expand Medicaid, the that the disparity that we're seeing, the um, lack of access that we're seeing uh, with COVID-19, do you think that that gives votes uh, for making the case for the medical case for the need to expand Medicaid? That's the question that Roy asked. Yeah, I, I, I think it gives a unique opportunity for us to remove the politicalization of healthcare. Uh, and I think the challenge for expanding, certainly for certain points of view has been the cost. And I realize that's not easy, but I, I think you have to weigh where your investments are and when, where do you pay for it later or earlier. So I don't deny the cost issue, but I don't think it's insurmountable. And then the second is, is the, a willingness to remove the political labels off of healthcare in order to address the needs of our people. And, and you're right, uh, the, the greatest driver of bankruptcy is medical expenses for individuals. The requirement to be able to get on Medicaid in Alabama as a family of four has to earn less than $3,800 in a year. So you don't know who can do that, who fits that criteria. It's usually single moms or kids are the only ones who can fit that. So the reality is I understand the financial conservation that the state has tried to do, but I think there's also been this huge effort to politicize healthcare and as it relates to Medicaid expansion, and people have forgot what was the sole purpose of doing it. The purpose was to give people access to care and means to get treatment 
so that in times like these, they wouldn't be isolated. That, that was in large purpose. The other purpose was to reduce the cost of healthcare, which is not terribly sustainable. All of those things were the intended purpose. And fortunately, the, the really making this a political issue has really removed the opportunity for better opportunities to expand this to occur. I think this uniquely puts it back in a different, different setting to take the politics off the picture and talk about what's right for our citizens. I absolutely agree. You know, I've always said that we have to put the expansion of Medicaid is about people, not politics. And um, so I just want uh, Roy, you to know that I'm pressing very hard in the next package. Uh, I did this past package and will continue to uh, to get my bill, which would allow states like Alabama to get the 100 percent federal match, even though that time period has gone away. We have to incentivize the states, the 14 states that have not expanded Medicaid because it's good, it's not, it's not, it's good for the people of the state. Let's forget the politics of it. It's about getting access to more people within our state. And so um, I'm trying to push that we uh, incentivize, uh, we don't have to call it Affordable Care Act, we don't have to call it Obamacare, it's just good for the people more people to be to give be given access to health care and as uh, dr vicker said let's put aside the politics of it let's just think about how it would help more alabamians uh in this time of need um the other thing is i think um i've also got another question for us um, the questions are now coming in um let's see lee uh lee asked what can we do to to make sure that we are getting more opportunities um for uh, everyone to get tested throughout Alabama. Um, agreed, I, I think that that question really goes to, it's not just the black belt, it's all of Alabama that needs to have better testing. And I understand that um, the Scott Harris is doing all that he can to roll out as much as he can. Right now, testing is available, as I understand it, 57 counties. We have to get it to all 67 counties. And I know that that's the goal, but I also know that with limited resource, you have to prioritize both the kits as well as the equipment. And as you said, getting the swabs, I mean, you guys could process more tests at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, but it's just about getting the equipment in order to safely do the testing. Is that right, sir? That's correct. You've appropriately highlighted, even if we had it everywhere we wanted it, we may not have enough reagents or test kits to make it happen. And yet I think you have mentioned an opportunity that can incentivize that Many parts of the country, the president, our governor, and we all would love it too, are very much pushed to reopen our economies. Well, fundamentally to do that, as we just discussed, testing broadly is going to be so important to assure that we don't create more lives lost and more harm as we try to do this. Great, another question. There are lots of reports of experimental drugs killing people. What criteria is being used to determine if you have uh, COVID-19 and how many African-Americans have died as a result of experimental drugs? I'm 73 years old, I have never seen anything like this and I really want to know uh, how uh, about the making sure that we're not being experimented on and experimental drugs and trying to get the, the, the testing right. Um, sir, I can just say from my point of view, uh, look, we represent Alabama um, and we know about uh, the horrible uh, trials that, that the government uh, instituted in Tuskegee with syphilis that really make a lot of African Americans unsure about being a part of any test groups. But I can tell you, I know the doctor will tell you better than I, that it's important that when we're thinking about finding a cure or a vaccine or treatment therapies for COVID-19, that in these trials, we do have African-Americans and people across section of America uh, in order to make sure that any therapies and any drugs that do come to market, therapies that do come roll out, will have um, a better effect on a broader uh, cross section of Americans. Uh, Dr. Vickers, I, I mean, I'm not the doctor, but I can tell you from a political standpoint, we wanna make sure that we're not experimented on, but we also wanna make sure that we're present in these clinical trials when it comes to finding uh, vaccines and therapies. So Representative Sewell, you've highlighted one of the other major disparities is that African-Americans in clinical trials are represented tenfold less than their white counterparts. So in cancer clinical trials, for example, only about 3% of the people in, or will participate, only 0.3% of African-Americans participate. 
So first question is, I don't know of anybody who's died by virtue of experimental drugs who's African-American in this country. The study I quoted, who people who got high dose hydrochloroquine was in Brazil. Uh, so possible people of color, but it was a study trying to see if the higher dose made a difference. The other factor that Representative Sewell made very clear, so many of our drugs come out and they are, they are designed around other populations and not ours because we've not been included in the trials. So to make sure the drug really represents the ability to treat all of America, not just a segment, we need to be involved in the clinical trials. You need to be informed. You can ask for a navigator who can help explain it to you for someone who you can relate to. You need to understand what risk there might be. And you need to understand sometimes it's given because they don't have any other alternatives. So those are important things to do. And in this scenario, this is a disease where fortunately 80% of the people will get better on their own. But because it's so infectious, there are about 5% of the people who get very sick and somewhere between three or 2% will die in a large number, largely because we don't have a therapy. So there are trials to try combinations of drugs. There are trials to try antiviral drugs. And there are tons of tests and research going on now to see if we can get a drug that actually will, first of all, cause no harm, but truly attack the virus and some of its effects on our bodies. So uh, two big uh, quick questions. Uh, uh, Catherine asks, uh, do you think that African-Americans illnesses are treated the same way as other groups? And will the therapy that works, uh, I mean, are they being treated differently when it comes to the treatment of COVID-19? Um, I, I would say um, there's always a risk of, of, of unintended and unconscious bias. Uh, I think we all have that to some degree. And I, I, I understand the fact that if an African-American, young African-American male comes into an emergency room, the first perception he's, is he's probably not a CEO. Um, and that I, we can't remove. And so some of those exist. But in general, I think healthcare professionals, particularly in this disease, care about all of their patients who come in independent of their color or creed. I think they want to see them to get the best outcome. And the other driver in this scenario is that a lot of times when a patient comes to the hospital, your, your attitudes toward them are determined by the entourage that's with them. Um, in this case, everybody's isolated. The only family you have are the, health, are the healthcare workers. So they don't have any way to judge you from anyone else because it's just you and them. And so as I've observed here at UAB, and I can speak here clearly, I believe we take care of all people, but particularly African-Americans, because we know sometimes a lot of their problems are not caused by themselves, but the social situations around them. We want to make sure they get the very best of care and want to make sure we do all we can. But I do think that's occurring broadly as well. The other question was uh, from Mona. Mona asked, um, is there any possibility that COVID-19 is killing sickle cell carriers? Ah, we, we don't know, but I, I will tell you that there, um, there's certainly early evidence that it has, a, has some effect, potentially has some effect on red blood cells. There's patients get a really high ferritin count or iron count, and, and that can occur from red blood cells and heme being released. So we don't know that it does, and nobody's reported yet that I've seen that sickle cell creates an increased risk of dying, but I wouldn't be surprised because of the need to carry oxygen and the need to be able to really sustain a, a really severe infection. Now, I've got a lot of questions here, and I'm gonna to try to sum them up about reopening the economy. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the governor had a press conference yesterday in which she um, said, you know, her stay at home order ends April 28th, and she's looking to get feedback. She's even inquired um, from members of Congress like myself to put together working groups within our own district to try to figure out when the, when the right time to reopen and under what conditions to reopen uh, the economy. And so I've gotten questions from Chris and from uh, Catherine and Ann and others who really want to know 
um, is May 1st, which is the date that people are hearing, um, is that a realistic date to reopen Alabama, especially considering we don't have widespread surveillance testing or a vaccine? Is it wise, one person even asked, is it wise to open up the economy until we find a cure? Um, I'm gonna just say from my point of view, and you and I talked a little bit about this, um, I, you know, I'm getting in reports from businesses, big businesses, medium-sized businesses, to the barbershop, the funeral home owner, I think that what we have to do, the driving force for when Alabama should reopen our economy has to be based on science and based on data and facts that our public health professionals like yourself, Dr. Vickers, um, can tell us when we're in the clear. Seems to me it has to be triggered by uh, some sort of ability to know if we've reached our peak and have we been, uh, had some sort of trigger that we've seen 14 days or however many days of level test, you know, level um, number of cases coming in, some sort of trigger that is that is determined by our healthcare professionals based on the data. And then I think you've got to have testing, 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 especially in communities of color. If we're the ones dying from this disease and disproportion, I want to see testing in the Wiregrass, testing in the Black Belt. I want to see testing in inner city Birmingham, inner city, you know, uh, Tuscaloosa. We want to see sites on in our communities where we can go and get tested. So testing, I want to be able to trace it, know, you know, who has it, who they've been in contact with, and I want treatment, adequate treatment. So I think that you and I talked about the three T's um, that I think will drive any reopening of the economy. But from a healthcare professional, do you think, and this is what all the questions I'm getting, uh, do you think that we can open back government after April 28th? Open back you know, I, I first give you an honorary medical degree. Um, <laughs> so I think you're very right. I think those are really the appropriate things. And obviously you've studied this and that's, those are the vital, vital points. I think the complexity of this is that there is no pre-existing roadmap. Right, so it, it's, it's gonna be a process almost for each area to have some basic principles and maybe each region to decide how they do that. I think a couple of the overarching principles that are important along with the three T's is that number one, you are right. We need to see a consistent period where cases are flat or declining. Uh, that, that is a sign that, that we have gone past our peak and we're at a period where we can potentially start to do some changes. I think the second piece is that I think we need to reiterate and make it very clear that whatever we do, even when we call it reopening, it's not returning the normal. We will be in a new normal. It won't be, it will be probably wearing masks for several months. It probably will be distancing. So putting 50 people in a tight space to eat won't occur. Putting 100,000 people in some setting probably will be difficult to happen. So the new normal still has to be kept in mind that even as we open, the behaviors have to still be maintained in order for us to prevent this from a major rebound. And then I, I think you're right. Um, the, the, the thing that is going to be so important is, as you've highlighted, the communities that we have been left out, because as I mentioned, in the normal healthcare world, they weren't getting great care. Well, obviously in this world, they get less attention. If we don't pay attention to them, everything will go bad for everybody. Not just those people, but it will be bad for everyone if we don't do that. So our, our, our connectivity needs to not be forgotten. And as we look at those communities that have limited resources, and that are our most vulnerable citizens, they need it as much as anybody so that we all actually can move to a point where we get over this virus. You know, one of the suggestions that you made in your op-ed was just that, that um, we have to visibly see in these communities where we have these health disparities, uh, we need to see uh, our state um, show a good, a good, you have a good faith showing that yes. they are making every effort to prioritize the testing, tracing, um, providing the kind of protective equipment. And I get that this is not going to be medical, medical grade. We need to say yeah. that to you all because yeah. we have limited 
a limited shortage. We have a shortage in limited resources, but we've got to have masks. I mean, if, if we're saying that that can protect us, if we're doing, you know, the onus is on us to help ourselves. Um, yes do the personal hygiene to we have to be able to be able to um, when we open up uh, the economy make sure that there is a supply chain issue here where we're getting the equipment the protective gear uh to the places that need it most uh and that we have broad broad base access to these um the, this equipment representative so there may also be an opportunity you mentioned the second t for for really seeking down those those individuals at risk a lot of times, both in rural areas, it takes individual volunteers to actually go out and reach people who said, who someone said I was in contact with them. They don't have a computer to go on a web page, or they may not even have a smartphone. Um, but it may take, it may be an opportunity for actually providing work opportunities for many people in those areas to be a part of tracing and going into the communities to find out when somebody's been identified of having uh, been connected with someone who had the virus. And we, you'll hear more about a, a program with Microsoft that we want to put forward to Dr. Harris that Washington State is doing and that California and Michigan are doing that we think can be a model that can help us begin to document a process for looking at at risk and tracing. So one question um, that Tamara asks is, what are the protocols for following up with people who have tested positive to ensure that they are self-quarantined, that they're taking their medicine? And is there any way, I'm gonna add this part, and is there any way that we can, um, what's the protocol if you are tested positive in, in order to inform others that they may have been around? So if, first of all, if you've tested positive, it needs to be, make sure it's reported to our state department Department of Public Health. And that's where the contact tracing begins right now. Um, and understanding that there may be limitations in what's done, but that's the source of where that begins. The second piece is that we have opened a specific COVID-19 clinic uh, at, at UAB, uh, largely because we know those patients need to be in a unique area as they're still uh, actually going through convalescence and they need reassurance. And secondly, we need to make sure over time that the virus doesn't create any permanent damage. We don't know yet. It's still obviously very early. Uh, so yes, you need follow-up. Uh, we have a specific clinic to do that. Uh, people certainly should wear a mask, wear gloves, and keep their distance as they go out. But that's very appropriate once you have been diagnosed or tested positive. Great. Um, the other question, I think I can answer this one, is what about the patients that don't have insurance? Are they be turn, being turned away? It's been said that those patients aren't being treated as others with private insurance. Let me just start by saying um, that Congress has passed three bills, and it was in the second bill that we said that diagnostic testing for anyone who is symptomatic should be for free. So the diagnostic testing, Congress has said, we will pick up the tab for anyone who is, being, who has symptom, who is symptomatic and needs to be tested, we will pick up the tab for free testing, diagnostic testing. I think that the next step for Congress is to ensure that those who get it, who are uninsured, get treatment for free. So that, and, and, and CARES too, I'm fighting to make sure that treatment for the uninsured is free as well. But um, I know that um, you guys take a Hippocratic Oath or whatever it's called, <laughs> doctor, uh, that, uh, that says that you guys, if you, if you come to UAB, and you need to be treated, you're not asking folks, are you insured, not insured? You're treating people as they come in. Um, so there should not be any discrimination going on between uninsured and insured during this pandemic uh, when it comes to people who are symptomatic uh, and needing to be tested and treated. So you're correct. At UAB, we obviously see a lot of high and tertiary care, or quaternary care patients, but in two phases, number one, we, we get support from the state, so we have a significant commitment to taking care of those who have limited to no means. Uh, a part of our mission, and several million spent a year on that. The second piece is that our physicians are paid in a manner that if you have no insurance versus you have Blue Cross and Blue Shield, they get the same amount. They are agnostic to whether you have insurance or not. They get paid the same dollar value for what they do, whether you have insurance 
or whether you actually have Blue Cross Blue Shield. So we very much take care of people who don't have insurance uh, at any level. Uh, I think that you're highlighting the challenges. We're now having to sort of go back and take care of population that if we had them under some measure of insurance, that we would have a means to potentially take care of them. The second aspect of this that relates to that other question about when to open up, and we didn't talk about it yet, but anywhere from 20 to 40% of patients who carry COVID-19 have no symptoms at all. They don't know it, right? So the problem is you have a significant percentage of people who have no illness and they carry the virus. And yeah. that has been as low as 20%. And in some populations, as high, certain studies as high as 45%. So there's a group that also points toward more testing because the reality is not everybody who has COVID has symptoms. There are a lot of people who don't. Now, so could we reopen in a paradigm that allowed folks to test temperatures coming in as a means of being able to identify uh, people who may be symptomatic? Given that we don't have enough tests to go around, the question was, are there other things that we can do to open up uh, the economy in, and I agree that it has to be sequenced. I don't think that you're gonna be able to have, there's not a magic date and there's not a magic switch that one turns on, but um, can you foresee other ways that one can uh, be able to uh, have a more positive indicator of whether someone's sick uh, coming into a workforce, a workplace, if we are, are opening up uh, the economy? Yeah, you, I mean, most of our, our strategies are imperfect, but they're reasonable for us to basically make some screening. So I think checking temperature is a good one. It doesn't mean you have COVID, but it probably means you have some infection, and it's probably a good thing to say you shouldn't come to work if you have a high fever, right? So it's not completely specific, but it is sensitive that something is going on. So checking temperature is not a bad way to go at all. Obviously, when someone does have any type of symptoms, that's an opportunity to make sure they get tested and in some ways isolated. And then I think the other thing that we're hoping uh, that gives us some ability to understand what happens in the workforce is this area of serology testing. And, and the problem that exists right now, Congressman Sewell, is that because it's a bit of a wild west and there is no, uh, no mechanism completely designed to oversee and validate some of these tests. There are like 80 companies, 70 companies that got these tests out. The problem that I mentioned is that all of us have been exposed to coronavirus. Not this one, but we've been exposed to ones that are in our humans already. Many of these tests, unfortunately, pick up those antibodies and can't necessarily distinguish between the coronavirus 19 versus the infection you had last year. So getting tests that have high specificity so that they have the ability to truly not detect false positive patients is a real asset. We can potentially do thousands of those daily, which could give us some sense if somebody has antibodies to COVID-19, it's not a guarantee. So there is immunity and antibody testing. The antibody test is a good inference that you should be immune. Uh, the immunity is only proven if you get exposed and you don't get infected. Can you actually be reinfected? Can you get the virus, get over it, then re, be re, uh, uh, reinfected? In theory, you shouldn't. In some, I think, antidote cases where people didn't develop an immunity, they probably could. It's uncommon. But in general, the principle and thought is that once you've had it, you've probably developed a level of immunity not to get a second infection. What are the risks of a second or third wave if we open, reopen Alabama uh, economy up too soon? Um, what is the risks of us getting a second or third wave in your opinion? So I think it's a, a, a maybe a two or threefold. Number one, I think if we start down this road of opening up and we go in a, in a, in a at least non-staged or full bore manner, I think we risk in a huge emotional hit to our people and to our economy. That is, it will be hard to pull people back. And yet you will now probably exacerbate the number of people now going back to hospitals, laying off work and getting 
uh, sick and dying. Secondly, I think that if we, if we do it in a stage manner and are clearly making it very clear to everyone that you have to behave these hyper intense efforts to keep your face covered, to wash your hands, to keep distancing, and to be mindful of the environment you're in, I think we have some chance to be able to stop things if we find a small outbreak coming back. I think we have a chance to adjust if we need to. Uh, and I think also it's the driver, as I mentioned to you, <coughs> for us to test those areas that we have ignored. Previously, we've ignored areas because they didn't simply have people coming up and dying, right? And, and we say they don't have a lot of disease. Well, they don't have any disease because we're not testing them. The driver now is that if we want to reopen and have people back mingling together, if we don't test them, we potentially now create a new outbreak. Now, um, I know we are coming to the close of our hour, but I wanted to just ask, um, I'm hearing an awful lot of anecdotal evidence that um, that folks in some of these very um, at-risk populations and, and, and communities are not taking COVID-19 seriously. I, I just want to dispel the myth. I think that um, the reality is that all of us now, by now, everybody in America knows that this, we are in a serious pandemic crisis. I think that those of us who have grown up in the history, in the African-American community, we are guided by our faith. And I believe that we are taking it seriously. I also know that you note that you and your other health professionals said it's important to have trusted healthcare professionals, trusted um, community leaders out there leading the charge about how serious this is. I want everyone to, who uh, can hear my voice say, this is serious and we have to take it serious. I know you are, but I want to take, I want you to continue to take it seriously. No matter what the governor decides to do in terms of opening back up this economy, we have to continue to rely on our own self, our own um, making sure that we're protecting our own community, our own family by doing everything we can with our own personal hygiene, taking seriously uh, the, the, the need to wear some facial cover, even if we have to make it. We know that we often have to make nothing out of make something out of nothing and we can do that we have to be first and foremost be our own best advocates we have to do that and i think that today by having dr vickers on our facebook live uh, i hope you understand that we're trying to get our trusted community doctors also saying to you the importance of your own personal protection you know these health disparities are not our fault but it can be our fault if we're not doing everything we can to mitigate and lessen the effect of that. It is clear that through COVID-19, we've put a spotlight on systemic and structural disinvestment in our community and in the African-American healthcare outcomes. That's just a fact. And it's given us an opportunity, those of us in positions of, uh, of influence in the, in the government, leverage to go back and ask for more resources and more um, opportunities to be able to try to correct that. But nothing, nothing suffices more than us being our own personal best advocates for our own health and the health of our family and our communities. Uh, Dr. Vickers, I want to give you an opportunity um, to give your closing thoughts on this as a trusted healthcare professional. Um, you know, I think that what you have to say about uh, what we in the African-American community and all of the communities in Alabama, but especially those that are disproportionately affected by this, what are your thoughts and closing thoughts about, um, about getting us uh, the health care we need and being able to, uh, uh, your thoughts about how we can endure the next few months. I mean, the reality is that a cure has not come forth and any vaccine I understand is 12 months away Yes. What are your best thoughts about what, um, what we can be doing as a community? I think we have an opportunity, particularly in our state, Congressman Sewell, to actually come together as a people broadly. Um, and I think in genuinely Alabamans want to do what's right and do, do well by each other. I think the first step in getting there is, as you said, 
Uh, we as a culture and as an African-American people have had a history of being able to look at right and wrong and distinguish what the right thing to do is. Society and the world has often depended on us as a people to identify justice at some level and say this is right and wrong. That needs to occur in our own communities. This is very clear, as you said, there was this myth about um, four weeks ago that this was a virus that couldn't affect, infect black people. It was a rich people's disease. And, and obviously it was in that world because they were the only ones who had the money to get tested. And so, or they had cars to drive through testing because the only way you got tested, you ever have a car to drive through. Absolutely. That, that myth is gone and it ought to be very blatantly clear to every person, both white and black, but particularly African-Americans, that this disease has ravaged our communities in a disproportionately harmful way. We then, the way we get others to help us is that we demonstrate we're willing to help ourselves. We demonstrate that we're willing to check each other and call us out when we, when we either see or implement behaviors that are not helpful for the broader community. And, and that's going to be really important because right now, no, as you said, we can't just go give a pill to everybody in, in our communities or any community. It really is the behavior that we have to own. And I realize that in our communities, it's not easy, right? We don't have people living in, we do have some people living in large homes, but we don't have everybody living in large homes. So you often don't have a lot of space to distance, but we have a people that have always been built on ingenuity. We have never been limited by simply resources to make something work. So we can make this work too, if we get, as you said, and we said in the op-ed, get people who you trust, who we know are trusted, to speak truth in a language, but also in a voice that can draw people and get their attention and move them toward a behavior that that same movement and behavior that changed this country needs to be that changes our community. Absolutely. I want to thank everybody for, um, for listening in. We're going to put this video up on our website, sewell.house.gov. I think that um, there's, it's so important that we speak truth to power. And I want to thank our special guests, uh, Dr. Vickers, you uh, do us proud each and every day in what you um, what you have accomplished as a surgeon and as a doctor, but uh, you're doing us proud by just talking to average ordinary uh, Alabamians who are just trying to make it. And I, I appreciate your um, willingness to uh, speak to us um, at this uh, Terry talk. I want to end by something that you said in your op-ed. Uh, you drew upon uh, the voice uh, that so many of us in our African-American community rely on, and that, that is our uh, beloved uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. But you said that um, in, at a moment, at this moment of crisis for our country, it is instructive to remember this passage from Dr. Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail. Quote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all of us indirectly. I think that those words that were said in 1963 by Dr. Martin Luther King uh, as he was speaking to uh, the clergy of Birmingham uh, when he was in that jail is still true today. We are all tied in an inescapable, uh, inescapable uh, destiny what does happen to one of us affects all of us. And that's why any effort to get us through this crisis means that we must treat, we must test our lowest common denominator in order to ensure that everyone uh, can get through this crisis uh, as a whole. I thank you, Dr. Vickers, for your time today. And I thank all of you for listening and let us remember that we are all linked together in this crisis and that we all must do and be our own best advocates, health advocates for each other in our community. And we do that by showing that we care about ourselves. So thank you to everyone for listening. And Dr. Vickers, thanks again. I know that you're very busy, but for you to give us this time during this hour means so much. 
Thank you, Congressman Sewell. It was my pleasure and thank you for what you do in serving us. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody. Stay tuned to next uh, Wednesday for another Terry Talk. Thanks.